Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to our online event today entitled Fusion Fact or Fiction um, and this is being streamed as part of the online programme for the York Festival of Ideas 2021. So today we're going to be presenting a recording of the episode of a Glass of Seawater podcast series uh, which is run by Fusion CDT students and we talk all about the research that we do into investigating fusion science and trying to um, develop ways to make fusion more efficient and be able to happen right here on all on the earth. Um, so to briefly introduce ourselves, um, my name is Emma. I'm also joined by Sid and Hassan today and we are all, us three are fusion PhD students and we're all carrying out physics research alongside this uh, fusion CDT programme, trying to look into um, understanding fusion a little bit more. Uh, primarily we're just carrying out a lot of simulations basically to try and model it and try and see what we can find out from that. We're also thrilled to be joined by a very special guest today, and that is Dr. Melanie Windridge. Um, she holds a number of exciting roles within the field of fusion, um, among which this includes being the, uh, the UK director for the Fusion Industry Association. She also works as a consultant for Tokamak Energy, and she's also started a very exciting new venture as the founder for Fusion Energy Insight, which looks at working with um, the energy industry to communicate developments in fusion, and also work on trying to establish ways to introduce fusion energy into the energy mix once, once we've got it working hopefully. Um, so thank you all very much for coming on to the episode today and um, I think it'll be quite an interesting one and I think we've got a lot to talk about as we go through them I think it'll be really cool and um, I certainly found it quite interesting trying to go through them all and pick them apart a little bit so we shall see how it all goes. Um, so this episode has been pre-recorded ahead of the event. Um, most of us will be attending it and kind of watching in the audience now, which feels a little bit weird watching ourselves talk, but we've heard it. <laughs> um, so I believe there is a live chat going on alongside this, uh, the streaming of the episode on this YouTube channel as well. So if you do have, you know, any questions or comments that you'd like to make as this episode is streamed, please do pop them in the chat and one of us will actually be able to respond to you live and we can hopefully start a bit of a conversation there about um, some of the things that we've discussed during the episode today. So to kind of introduce everything, um, today we're focusing on exploring how fusion has been represented in media and more specifically how it's been represented in movies. So we've chosen a few key examples um, from famous movies over the years and we're going to have a bit of a chat about how realistic they actually are. Um, <laughs> bag, you know, some of them are a lot better than others. Um, some of them were quite impressive, others... Not so much. <laughs> not so much, they're a little bit interesting, definitely. Um, so yes, yeah, so nuclear fusion is quite a you know, specific area of science. You know, we obviously know quite a lot about, about it, we all work with it day to day, but we are aware that in the audience, you can have quite a mixed range of experience and knowledge about it. So some of you may know about it already through uh, like school documentaries, public outreach, indeed through film or TV, you may have heard about it already. Um, but some of you may not have a clue, which is absolutely fine because we are just about to explain what it actually is. Um, so to kind of cover our first point, we'd like to cover, you know, what is fusion? What actually is fusion? Anyone? 
Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll go. Um, I, I love to explain what fusion is. Um, so fusion is basically the opposite of how current nuclear energy works, which is like splitting the atom apart. We're more about bringing things together and um, in the process of bringing um, two hydrogen atoms together, we produce a lot of energy. And it's, it's kind of been a dream um, for like a lot of people for a long time because the amount of energy produced is so like so large and it can really like solve a lot of like the world's energy problems if we can get it to work. And yeah, that's I guess why it's so exciting and why it's always in films and stuff. Um, just because of the applications. Yeah, so it's kind of key to know that we can actually get it to happen already, right? We can get fusion to happen here on Earth, and we do have these kind of prototype machines already that can get fusion to work, but it's not quite there yet, is it? Yeah, and of course we know fusion works like in the universe because fusion is a reaction that's actually happening in the sun and the stars all the time. And uh, so... It works, but obviously stars are very different <laughs> here on Earth. And so if you want to harness it as an energy source uh, on Earth, then you have to do things very differently. And so that's what fusion research is all about. Yeah, that's always a lovely description of it, kind of trying to make mini stars here on Earth, isn't it? We're trying to make a little sun in a box, but obviously the sun is quite big. So trying to kind of replicate that here on such a very dense scale, it is really tough, right? We encounter a lot of problems with things like, you know, the materials that you try and build your box out of to hold our stars will tend to melt quite often. Mm. So there's a lot of kind of problems in trying to get that to actually work is, as you can imagine, quite, quite tough. Um, but and I guess well. I was going to say one of the, one of the main uh, sort of branches of fusion, I think that, that appears most in, in, in media is, is magnetic confinement where like, instead of the sun sort of keeps everything together using its, its massive mass, right? It's uh, big gravitational forces. We don't have that here. And so one method is putting this like mini star in a sort of magnetic cage and keeping it there. And, and we'll see, I think a lot of examples in media are mainly around that, although there are a lot of alternative schemes as well. Um, some of which do appear in movies as well. No, absolutely. <laughs> they do use that. Um, so it's quite good that they do use it in movies because actually that's kind of, I'd say the front runner at the moment of what we think is going to be the most viable option. At the moment, we think, you know, these magnetically confined devices are probably going to be the one. But, you know, things change, things develop. Um, mm. Things have changed massively even in the past 30 years. So where we'd be in 30 years time from now could look completely different. Um, so yeah, this kind of development into trying to achieve fusion on Earth has been going on since. I think it first happened back in the 1930s. So it's been going on for a long time, um, trying to actually make fusion happen. Um, and awareness and kind of public knowledge about has increased over time and people are learning more about it and there's been like big press releases about how much to make this amount of energy um so it has obviously as all kind of big scientific breakthroughs and big magic science does finally made it way into kind of science fiction and it has broke into there um so yes and the natural place to start in terms of you know investigating fusion on screen is to look at the very first time it was shown on screen and the first example um, that we have today is actually from Back to the Future, which is back in what 1985. A movie. What a movie. I hadn't actually seen it before. <laughs> right. uh, Whoa. I hadn't seen it, so it was quite a novel one. Um, yeah. it, it is a good movie. It was quite reassuring to see after the time of, you know, everyone bigging it up and, have you not seen it? It was worth seeing. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, please do, please do watch it. It is interesting. Um, so yeah, so in Back to the Future, their kind of fusion device that they introduce is this kind of um it almost like this looks like this small white coffee pot style reactor um and it's called the mr fusion home energy reactor and it seems to be established as kind of a bit more of a kind of like everyday mini fusion devices used to power multiple things um the main one that we're showing is that it's used to power the um some components of the delorean time machines i think it powers the flux capacitor and the time circuits it's used as a kind of very thing. real things very real. <laughs> they do. there's some key science words there i don't know if they could necessarily go well together but yeah. <laughs> so it works like that um and interestingly in the movie the main fuel that's shown of being used for this reactor is actually household rubbish so we see doc brown putting in um i think it was a banana peel and a can of beer he just pops it in produces energy and that's absolutely fine apparently and i don't know as a scientist watching that it kind of made me cringe a little bit. The idea of using rubber <laughs> is feel. I don't know what do you, what do you all think about that as a concept? 
Well, to me, that's what I dream of. Like, like the end and <laughs> end goal of fusion. It would be so nice to have like a tabletop thing where you throw anything in there. It makes power. It transforms your garbage into like helium or whatever. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's probably not how it's going to be. At least, at least for the uh, the upcoming century or so. <laughs> Absolutely. Because yeah, yeah. Well, you can so see why it's a nice. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> you can see why it's a nice dream, can't you? Because yeah. it's like, yeah, it's it's like ideal. Um, I think one of the key issues is um, the, the idea of like anything being able to, to fuse because actually on, well, in stars, the easiest things to fuse are the, are the lightest particles, the lightest elements. So generally hydrogen comes together to make helium. And in stars where you can get really extreme conditions, then they they do have a chain. So when they when they run out of hydrogen fuel, they can start fusing the heavier things. So they can start fusing helium and then you can make oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and all those things. Like yeah, all the elements are made in stars, but mm. they're quite extreme. Yeah. And uh, on earth, like it's very, very difficult to get those. It's, it's difficult to get the extreme conditions that we need even for basic <laughs> hydrogen fusion, like let alone the higher, uh, you know, the heavier elements um, fusion. And so we, it, we're always looking for like really pure vacuums in our fusion devices. They put a huge amount of effort <laughs> into taking everything out, like even the air and even getting the, um, like the oxygen and the water vapor like out of the walls of the machine. They have to make it really, really pure just so that you have a pure plasma, it's called, which is a fuel, it's hot fuel. Um, because if you have impurities in there, then they just sort of get in the way of all the things that you're trying to fuse together. And so it's just quite funny, really, that the, the idea that you could put anything in, but, and particularly like heavy things, like, I don't know. Yeah, like, I don't know if they put metals in, but I think some of the others do. But anyway, so like just the idea that anything could go in yeah. is just quite funny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think in one of the pictures they literally just put like a can of beer or some coke or something yeah, into yeah. it, <laughs> and that's like enough. <laughs> <laughs> if it's well, good enough time... to fuel humans, it's good enough to fuel the Tellurian. <laughs> next time we're we we're, we're close to a tokamak, just uh, open up the top <laughs> or a magnetic confinement fusion device. Open up the top, pour a little beer in there, and then. Uh... <laughs> that's not a missing ingredient. That's all we need. Just a bit of beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely an interesting oh. device from that perspective. Um, so yeah, so when we've been talking yeah. about fusion kind of expanding it, we talk about it in terms of these like mini suns, right? You need these kind of like hot plasmas to kind of try and make everything happen and make everything fuse. Um, but in this mini reactor, it appears to be, I think it's alluded that it uses cold fusion. Um, mm. So as you can imagine, cold fusion is essentially fusion at a much lower temperature, right? So it's, it's cold fusion and carries out at room temperature. Um, so yeah, do we know if cold fusion is something that's actually something that's investigated much at the moment? I mean, for a I while, don't think it, was, it is. For a while, it was like one of those weird areas of science where like most people thought it was like a little bit baloney, right? Because people had said, you know, oh, I got, I did this experiment and got cold fusion, but it was never replicated. But I saw something recently about NASA doing maybe something tangential called lattice confinement fusion, which might not be what most people think like cold fusion is like, but they still had some sort of fusion going on at, at relatively low temperatures, I think. Um, but I'm no expert on that. Um, yeah, there are still things being investigated. Um, they call it uh, LENA now, low energy nuclear reactions. And so there are some groups that are still still working on it. Um, but it's, but in, in general, yeah, cold fusion, there was a big furore in uh, about 1989 where scientists Pons and Fleischmann thought that they'd achieved cold fusion and they hadn't and it was widely discredited and um, the way that they've done it actually is um, you need to ha it, it's um, they have palladium I um, electrodes <laughs> in in the and they're, tr they're trying to squash deuterium ions like deuterium particles into this metal lattice so i mean i've never seen it myself but i mean it sounds like you're trying to put a, like a gas into a solid so the idea <laughs> of it's not like a magnetic confinement fusion where you've got a, a vessel like an empty vessel that you can pour beer into yeah <laughs> you know it's so it's, a, it's like they're mixing their concepts here in the in the film yeah so but yeah the, the, i think that cold fusion 
if it works, it would open up like interesting questions about like the, the basic physics of it because mm. fusion is really hard and you need such extreme conditions because there's a big repulsive force between these particles that you want to get to come together. It's called the Coulomb repulsion. And so you have to put a lot of energy in to overcome this repulsive force. So therefore, if you don't have to put a lot of energy in, i.e. you can do it cold, then something weird is happening. Yeah, why so that's, is that, right? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's really interesting, but it's not um, It's not necessarily going to be the fastest way to clean energy, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, I agree. Well, actually, speaking of, uh, you, you, Melanie, you almost pretty much described uh, this palladium electrode, cold fusion thing. Uh, that's actually the uh, fusion device in uh, our next movie, The Saint, which is a, a 1997 sort of spy debauchery movie uh, starring Val Kilmer, um, who <laughs> essentially, the whole movie is essentially just him dressing up in different spy outfits. He's like, he's, uh, and, and they're, they're all named after saints kind of thing. It's quite, it's quite a funny concept. But the whole thing revolves around him trying to steal what they call the the equations that have cracked cold fusion and they actually say that the, the type of cold fusion they're working with some electrochemist in the movie has cracked cold fusion with a palladium electrode and like deuterium ions um going on to that uh palladium electrode uh but one thing that's really interesting about this movie is that with its whole sort of spy thing and the russians and the americans trying to steal sort of uh, the supply for cold fusion is it deals with those sort of um, geopolitical implications of, of, you know, if we magically solved fusion tomorrow, how would that kind of um, change our world? And I think that's, that's uh, an interesting question. I'm wondering what you guys, what you guys think about that. If we solve fusion tomorrow, would, are we ready for that? What, 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 uh, what sort of implications would that, would that have? Well, I mean, I, I think right now a lot of people would be very happy, but back in the time when this movie was made, it was <laughs> a bit more tense, uh, just coming out of the Cold War and all that. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's not many people that would complain about, you know, having as much energy as we could ever want. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are certain other competing interests that I guess um, you always have to consider. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I think, Melanie will uh, be able to tell us a lot more about that actually. <laughs> yeah, I think there will be, I think there will be some, like big implications of fusion um, that we may be uh, like, don't even really think about so much now. I'm sure some people are thinking about them, but we don't as, as researchers. Mm. And, um, and I think that you're right, Hassan. I think that things have changed like over the last, however many 30 years or so since it was, this film was made. Um, and I think that, Maybe back then, uh, it, it, it would be the kind of thing that there would be like vested interests wanting to shut it mm. down. I think now things have changed. They've got to a point where there's enough public demand for new technologies and like people want, people are serious about climate change, countries are making targets. So I think that even, even the oil and gas companies recognize that they they do need to transition of course oil and gas are still important in like various areas of our lives even now so it's not going to like instantly change and there will always be like petrochemicals and there'll be other industries so um but i think that there's recognition that as far as energy goes there does need to be a transition so it's less likely to be just like stopped or shut down it's more likely that these companies would well, use it, take it over, license the yeah. technology. Um, that's what I would hope anyway. But the other thing that's, I think, funny or interesting to think about is like how things, or how quickly things change the world. Mm. Because like, I think, I believe that fusion will change the world, but it will happen slowly. Like to roll out big power stations, these things can take years, sometimes decades, but hopefully not decades, but at least mm. years to build. So commercial rollout is going to take time, especially globally. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be a quick transition. There's going to be time for adaptation. What could change things is, is if there, if it was possible to do something tiny. Yeah, maybe like cold fusion or like, let's say you had a palm top fusion device that yeah. suddenly emerged out of nowhere and suddenly you could do everything with this device, which is what the films generally, um, generally talk about, by the way. Like, and that's, and that's, that's also a funny concept because energy is, is huge it's not just electricity it's also heat for industry yeah. and fuels for the transport you know mm. it, it's really diverse but so it's unlikely that you'd have one thing that can cover all those bases but maybe if you could 
and it was tiny and you could just build it like a smartphone and roll it out in a year or so maybe that would be like huge like some of yeah. these films anticipate like suddenly yeah. you shut down global oil and all of this has changed and but i don't believe that for something like fusion power it's not going to happen suddenly like that yeah. i think that's a very big difference <laughs> we're going to get yeah. a long run in <laughs> mm. Um, I, th I think that's the whole plot point of the next movie, um, where I think a quote is, um, you know, this discovery is too disruptive <laughs> and there's a lot of people trying to, you know, alleviate the effects of such a drastic change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so, that's yeah, what makes films exciting, isn't it? It's the, it's the conflict. Yeah. That's, that's what they want. Yeah, so, so actually, so the next movie, very similar to The Saint with Val Kilmer, we've got Chain Reaction, which is also, I believe, uh, they were in the same year, about 1997. This one starring our favorite uh, Keanu Reeves, uh, who's a sort of uh, a really, you know, tough guy, sort of a machinist at the, the University of Chicago who cracks the secret to, and I'm not sure if it's cold fusion, hot fusion, hydrogen power. He cracks the code to unlimited power, and it has something to do with hy hydrogen fusion, maybe. Um, <laughs> and yeah, th th this is again um, a movie about like you know if tomorrow you someone solved the energy crisis, and and like you said, Melanie, like it was something like tabletop size that you could just uh, completely change the world over in like in a day like how would people react to that and 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 this movie has morgan freeman as sort of this this the head of this secret cabal that sort of decides that the world isn't ready for fusion and like so he's, he's trying to sort of steal the secret so that like you know they can roll it out sort of steadily so they don't change the world too much um but like you said melanie i think any realistic rollout of fusion is going to take, you know, years or decades anyway. So, you know, it's not like people's minds will be blown overnight and, you know. <laughs> but it's an interesting uh, thought experiment and it gets people thinking about what the implications could be as yeah. opposed to it like happening really, really slowly. And of course mm -hmm. it makes drama. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I think is funny about that one, Chain Reaction, is, is even the name. Chain reaction, yeah, like chain. fusion is so hard to do. It's not a yeah. chain reaction. Like that's why we haven't done it yet. Like fission was comparatively easy because it happens naturally on Earth. All you have to do is trigger it, and once you trigger it, chain reaction. Yeah, keeps going. It's harder to control. <laughs> that has safety implications, of course. Though it can lead to like meltdowns. But fusion, like that, can't happen. Like mm -hmm. in fusion, if the conditions aren't perfect, everything stops. Yeah. Like, it's inherently safe, but it's also annoying because, like, it's really hard to do. Yeah. But so I find it funny that they've written a whole film about fusion and they've called it something like that's like reaction. nothing to do yeah. with fusion. Yeah. Well, and throughout the whole movie, they're always, I think, I think they're always like stressing its potential danger as well. Like, like in the first scene, there's there's a explosion that levels, you know, blocks of Chicago. And from what I can tell, it just seems to be like someone left some hydrogen around, and it's a, like just a hydrogen. <laughs> and I'm like, this this doesn't have oh. anything. If you you know do a tour of like you know any fusion site you know there's not like there's not like you know tons and tons of hydrogen just like laying around kind of thing <laughs> so i found that quite funny but like you said they have to add danger they have to add you know suspense somewhere right um, yeah it's like they come at it though with like knowing about fission and nuclear power and so they come at it like oh but fusion is like newer and sexier and so we want it to be about fusion but we want to have all these danger elements yeah, yeah. And i'm like but they don't apply <laughs> like it's not the same um, yeah. and we should be clear it's not to say that like fusion has nothing that like neutrons are highly energetic and you don't want to have people standing near which is another thing that films do by the way they like completely eliminate all the shielding around the machine <laughs> yeah. but like, you don't want to have people too close and it does create radioactive waste in the structure of the machine which means it does need to be decommissioned and uh and there is tritium usually involved on site which needs to be handled properly because it's radioactive but um but there's no risk of meltdown there's no long-lived radioactive waste produced. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different kind of um, thing, but that's really boring for people who are writing scripts. So they don't really like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been very evident from these examples that they kind of are definitely taking some artistic license with the science and kind of using it as a plot point rather than trying to show what would actually happen so much. Mm. You know, this is not how we'd see fusion to happen. You know, the fact they've got fusion fuel just lying around, like one of the main fuels that we use tritium, is notoriously hard to locate, right? It's hard for us to get that. So the fact they've just got loads of it all around, you know, I wish mm. it was that easy to just have stuff 
flying around like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're kind of treating it more like this. I think it's the whole lack of understanding, I think, in terms of fusion is still a relatively novel concept back in the 80s and 90s. You know, people mm. have kind of heard about it, but they don't necessarily know what it is and how it works. And it's quite evident in these movies, right, that they're not entirely sure how it works. They've got mm. a vague idea how hydrogen's involved. But that's kind of it. Yeah. Um, Especially chain you. reaction. Mm -hmm. I I, yeah. I personally am a big fan of like the what the reactor looked like in chain reaction, which was essentially like a clear sort of bathtub sized cylinder of bubbly water. <laughs> they shot some lasers in there. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Bubbles happened. And then the, the the icing on the cake is rather than sort of uh, it heats up walls, which is usually what we do, you know, to extract energy in MCF, it just it, it heats up walls. We use that to like spin a turbine or whatever. Rather than that, they have like hydrogen flames shoot out the back. <laughs> They're like energy. <laughs> and I, just, I really appreciate that sort of, uh, um, this m like mishmash sort of uh, view of like, uh, it, it, to me, it just looked very cool, if, if not a bit silly. <laughs> yeah, it definitely looks cool, but uh, from a fusion science perspective, maybe not so much. I suppose what's funny yeah. about, or, or where we are now in fusion, it's almost harder, I'd say, for the, for the filmmakers, because like back when Back to the Future was being made, Fusion was, it was being researched. They had Tokamax, of course, which is like the mainstream approach. Um, but it was, you could say, like fur further away. Well, the big jokes of Fusion always were. We shouldn't yeah. go the big joke, but you know. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is that like they, it, could, it was maybe a bit more science fiction. So they mm. could let their imaginations one, run wild and it was like science fiction. Whereas now we have a much clearer idea and even like getting towards designs for pilot plants and that kind of thing. So, mm. so now for the scientists, it's very much like less science fiction, but I think that for the public, it's still very much science fiction. Mm. And we spend like our whole time being like, well, no, I mean, we have actually done fusion. So it's not like completely science fiction. Yeah. And so mm. I think it's harder for the filmmakers now because they still want these kind of crazy science fiction ideas and we're going like no 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 it's not it's not like that it like, like yeah. <laughs> <this is how laughs> it yeah it kind of turns more science and yeah. less fiction i guess doesn't it you kind of yeah certainly in the over the past year since those movies have been released we've got a much clearer idea of what these reactors will look like right we actually have some kind of prototype reactors built well reactors fusion devices i guess um, and we've got no we've got more of an idea of what it's going to look like they kind of have to stick a bit more faithful to that and i guess it does restrict them a little bit right into what they can actually do um, but yeah, so certainly Having said that, to... technologies always change and yeah. they're, all, they're still changing things right now. And so you could imagine <laughs> like, okay, well, what if we had this yeah. new technology that enabled that? So that's yeah, still yeah, possible. Yeah. It's still pretty nice. Yeah, definitely. So I think certainly the idea that people are more aware of what a fusion reactor or a big idea of what one should look like, um, people have more knowledge about that. And I think that is more apparent in some of the more recent examples that we have. Um, so the kind of mm -hmm. most recent one that such we, as what Emma? such Please, as uh... what this is actually my favorite one. Um, so this, this is, is one that I remember the most. My childhood, I think I was about nine or ten when this one came out, and I remember this one so vividly even now. <laughs> Whenever I think of fusion, I still have the image of the reactor in this movie popping up. And this movie is Spider Man Two. So I know there's been oh, iterations yes. of Spider Man since the original Spider Man Two from back in two thousand and four. Around then, yeah, I think yeah, so. around then, around then. One of my all-time favorite movies too. I, I just love the quote: "The power of the sun in the palm of my hands." <laughs> oh, it's it's just so beautiful. Um, but yeah, I mean, so in Spider-Man too, they kind of do it's like they kind of learn from the mistakes of the past. They they actually address how hard it is to get tritium. You know, so Doctor Octopus. Um, mentions right before he starts his fusion reactor in the middle of New York City because that's a great place to, <laughs> to, put, to put like a fusion reactor. Um, yeah, he's like thanking them for like this super hard to find resource. Um, and then he proceeds to, you know, instead of using magnets or lasers to confine the fuse, uh, to confine the plasma, he just uses his tentacles. And I would just love that as an idea. Like tentacle confined fusion is like, <laughs> that would be the, the ultimate. <laughs> Oh man, I, I would just love like reactors around the world to just have a bunch of like Dr. Octopuses there with like these robot arms. <laughs> well, I think from what Emma said, that's what she dreamed she'd be when she was that is, like I a doctor it, octopus. Into it. <laughs> yeah. That's like, when do I get the, the tentacles? Is that after the PhD or? <laughs> That'd be the hope, yeah. It's a really interesting example, actually, because when you see him kind of achieving fusion, 
the way they do it is he puts this little pillow of tritium fuel in the middle of this kind of levitating holder. I'm guessing mm. maybe magnetic toy, <laughs> I don't know. And then he seems to use lasers to kind of fire onto the pellet to cause ignition to actually get the fuel burning. And then it just creates this mini sun. Like it literally looks like a sun. So mm. we usually do know, use kind of the metaphor of creating mini suns and mini stars to describe fusion. Um, I think we're taking that quite literally to actually yeah. make a mini sun <laughs> in the box. So it doesn't necessarily look like that in our reactors, but it's nice we've kind of used that metaphor to describe it. Um, Cause yeah, I guess it kind of is a mini sun. It shouldn't really look like one in our reactors, but it's <laughs> that's the kind of gist they're getting across which shows some understanding. But yeah, there is kind of, when you actually see it on the screen, what Melanie kind of alluded to before about it just being out in the open. It's kind of just floating <laughs> mm -hmm. there, the feels there. When he's kind of demonstrating it for the first time, Wrong people are standing like three meters away and it's like, yeah. you probably don't want to stand quite so close to it. Um, At least yeah. he's wearing goggles. That's, that's got to help it, but <laughs> I don't know. The safety goggles are not <laughs> And the big question, the big question in, in, in that film is, is is confinement and confinement is a word that like as scientists we use all the time because like that's what you have to do you have to confine your fuel you have to mm. when you're doing fusion you need to keep your fuel hot enough and dense enough for long enough for fusion to occur so you need to trap it confine it in some way and so all of the the different ways that we do relate to confinement so magnetic confinement fusion uses magnetic fields inertial confinement fusion uses like laser beams and Anyway, he's kind of got no confinement fusion. He's just got this, yeah. like, somehow, somehow. Tentacles, <laughs> tentacles. <laughs> yeah, so, he's just pressing it down from, from all the side. It's really weird. Yeah. Like, obviously, the sun, of course, like Sid said earlier, it's, it's the gravity that confines it, but mm. he hasn't got enough gravity in that yeah. tiny little <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. It, yeah, it it looks so sort of you know well like 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 if we tried to just put it like a a ball of plasma in a room, it would immediately just sort of especially if it's a vacuum, just expand and dissipate and cool, right? Um, mm -hmm. But he's got such a nice, perfect, spherical, well-behaved sun, which. Again, I, I really like this this uh, portrayal of fusion because, like you said, Emma, it's the idea that we all have of like putting a sun, a, a mini star on Earth, right? Um, maybe they're taking that a bit too literally, but again, creative license. I, I just really love the idea of of like having, you know, the power of the sun in the palm of my hand. <laughs> I think it's all awesome. so. What I want to know from you three is, did this film actually inspire you to be fusion researchers, or was it something else? Oh, one hundred percent. I I put it on my my personal statements oh, really? when I applied. Really? Like, really? yeah, wow, oh, wow. Yeah, no, it's a massive influence. That's <laughs> I good then. I, I, like, I, I wasn't under any illusions that this is how fusion would work, but just the <laughs> idea, like, just it just sounded so cool. And just the more I read into it, it was just like, wow. <laughs> and it went so <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just but I, I didn't uh, know I didn't clock that it was fusion um until I think much later so I don't think it was an inspiration to me but it's still a very cool movie <laughs> yeah I think it certainly inspired me in terms of science a little bit more I just thought it looked really cool the kind of things you could achieve because yeah when I watched it, I think I was too young to really appreciate what it actually was and what it was trying to show but the idea of creating this little power source from nothing kind of sounded it looked really cool and as I say kind of I think I refer back to it more now or when I first started to learn about fusion that is I think it's just ingrained in my brain of that is the image I always think of yeah. even looking at a top pack inside I'm always picturing the little yeah. sun inside I'm not, it's just, <laughs> I think it's the kind of things from childhood isn't it I think a lot of people have those kind of links for yeah. various things that's that's the first time you see it first time you remember it that stuck in which is why I guess that's why it's quite important to discuss how it's portrayed because for a lot of people like the first time that they see it on screen could be the way that stuck with them forever. Yeah. And I think this is such a good way to, to stick with you. Uh, like you said, like, it has such a great idea of like, you know, power from essentially nothing, right? Like a, a, a sun on earth. It's, it's it, it, you know, it's the, those ideas, like even though this didn't inspire me, those are the ideas that inspired me to do fusion, mm -hmm. right? power from essentially nothing you know a star on earth all these i think are really cool ideas and i think it's so great that that movie the movie's based on all these great ideas no absolutely uh, yeah um and just very quickly as well to kind of finish off this discussion um talk about some of like the ideas that i presents obviously doc ock is so cool because he has these robot arms right 
that are used to kind of engage with the fuel because obviously you can't go touching it right it's too hot whatever you can use these robot arms um and that isn't actually too far from reality actually in some of the reactors that we use these days right so there's the ray center down at column um which deals a lot with developing robotics to actually help kind of interact with these reactors and kind of help maintain them inside as well um, and they do actually look quite similar to these robot arms, right? <laughs> yeah. kind of, I'm not sure yeah. what they but maybe they took inspiration from Spider-Man. I, I don't know which way around Art inspires end. life, right? <laughs> it very well could be the case, but they do actually look quite similar. When you look at them, you can imagine them kind of like yeah. snaking around like Doc Ock's arms. And it's, <laughs> it's quite nice to look at actually knowing, knowing of that example and looking at that. So the kind of robotics yeah. to kind of help control fusion actually is a really important area to discuss as well. And, um, certainly an active area of research as well so that aspect is something yeah. that maybe people don't clock as being relevant to fusion nowadays but actually it is quite an active area to look into yeah. it's pretty cool um, but i suppose yeah. the key difference though is that the robots now on it on jet are being used for maintenance of the tokamak yeah. so it's Not. all remote handling and they're like <clears throat> they're like little snakes that like you say that can they can go through the tokamak and they can they can curve around and like reach the back of it and do all the ne- things that they need to do. And um, and it's a technique that we need to establish because in future fusion reactors, as I mentioned before, that if the if the walls themselves become slightly radioactive, then humans won't be able to go in to make repairs. So that's why this robotics work is important. That we have to we have to learn how to how to make repairs to future fusion reactions uh, reactors. Sorry. Um, but yeah, they're not they're they're not going to be used to use control. For, uh, yeah, the, 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 reaction, <laughs> the, like, plonk, anyway. plonk the fuel in or anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you can see how the design would have um, you know it follows that they use the same design because you need something that's really manipulatable. You know, it can it can curve. It's mm-hmm. not just like a, a straight line. Mm. It's got all these tiny little joints. Yeah. They remind me of um, you probably never saw them when you were kids, but like there were these little snakes that you could get. You'd hold the end of the snake. It was a little plastic toy with lots of little joints, yeah. and it would wiggle around like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like that. They're just like lots of little joints, which means that it can go through small portholes and it can move around and twist mm-hmm. and turn. And so, the maneuverability, I think, was something that. Dr. Octopus needed. Yeah. <laughs> but we also need in real life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a cool one to, to watch. I'm aware that there might be people in the audience that actually haven't seen it. Maybe you're too young to have seen it, but, <laughs> but please do watch it. Oh, no way. It might appear slightly dated now, but it is it is so worth the watch. So please do take the take the time to have a watch. What about have already. Back to the Future? <laughs> back to the future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, it's the most recent movie we've discussed yeah. in, <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, oh. so moving on, we do actually have quite a nice transition going from one superhero movie to another one. So it's quite um, prevalent in superhero kind of Marvel scenes. Um, so we go from Spider-Man to Iron Man. So they've actually got two um, main kind of fusion devices presented in this one, don't they? Yeah, so they have, well, I mean, they have the fusion device that actually goes into Tony Stark's heart, which somehow produces three gigawatts of like power yeah. in like something that big <laughs> and, and like frankly four, four. scary yeah. i looked that up apparently one gigawatt mm. can power about seven hundred thousand homes so three <laughs> gigawatts is going to power, power <laughs> over two million homes and he wants that in his body <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very fancy suit i think <laughs> but yeah i mean yeah, but it's quite like the larger one they have like the arc reactor is quite um true to life i mean they, they literally get the designs that they show on the movie from Jet, which is in Cullum. So it's the currently, like, um, the biggest fusion reactor that currently exists. Um, Iron Man literally like, took pictures from there. Um, and it actually is quite an accurate portrayal of, like, what a fusion plasma would look like. Although, again, like, the walls never look as good because in the movie, you know, it's see-through and you can just, like, look at the fusion plasma, happening. Yeah. Yeah, which you know, again, it's very thematically nice, but <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, we don't have the materials that allow us to both see into the device and also block all the neutrons and stuff from from like from leaving. Yeah, but um, overall, I think they nailed the look of that that big arc reactor. Especially the thing that got me actually, I, I rewatched it recently um, for this, and I was like, I was, I was honing in on that on that fusion scene where they go, "This is the arc reactor," or whatever. And what, what really nailed it for me was the way the plasma looks 
I feel like none of these mm -hmm. other movies have really nailed what like a plasma actually looks like inside of the machine. And I mean, we know because we, you know, we, we can have cameras set up inside the machine that sort of um, take videos and pictures of, of what the plasma discharge looks like. And I think they, they absolutely nailed it. it. It's kind of like a sort of wispy ghost, like, you know, um, like glowing, uh, like a, like almost like a, a led tube or something rather than like a, a sun, which again, a, a few of, uh, these movies show, you know, fusion like a sun. It's more just like a, I find plasma very cool. I, and it looks so like ghosty and wispy. And I think Iron Man just absolutely nailed that, which I really, I really like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, moving on the chess piece as well. And um, what Melanie was telling us before about cold fusion kind of allegedly being achieved in 89 for these chemists using um, palladium electrodes, right? I think maybe, maybe you need to correct me here, but I think the chess piece was made with a palladium core. Mm. I think that was the ring they tried to make it from. So I'm not sure if maybe that was actually meant to be some kind of cold fusion device in his chest. Maybe, maybe it's like maybe. Luke, lukewarm fusion or yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> it uses some kind of this, this palladium metal is used as kind of, you see him create this ring, right? That's yeah. part of the chess piece. And I, I think that's what that might be. So maybe they've kind of okay. borrowed from that theme trying to say for us is cold fusion. That's Obviously they don't necessarily say it by name what it actually is but yeah. if it's palladium it kind of it's a nice mm. coincidence right so i feel like yeah. maybe that's where they've kind of borrowed that's that quite interesting yeah. yeah and the fact he managed to build it in a cave as well <laughs> yeah, exactly. we can't we can't do it with like <laughs> so much funding all of these different research sites around the world we can't do it but all it takes is tony stark in a cave <laughs> 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 Where that comes dark. That's what yeah. we need. I wish it was well, like it's because we're too busy thing. simulating. <laughs> I was to say it's because we're too busy. Oh, cool. Doing your simulations. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just um, having a throwback to Chain Reaction because there they just cut out a lot of the process by just going straight to just making everything. Yeah. And they just cut cut out all the simulation work, which is what um, Emma said and myself like do do for a living yeah well the best girl, yeah someone asked keanu reeves they're like did you simulate your work last night and like you know he smolderingly looks at the camera he's like no i was too busy building it <laughs> and like if only it was yeah. that easy <laughs> if only we didn't have to simulate anything yeah i would love that it's uh, what i think is interesting about the films as well is that they always want like the hero so they want it to be like a one person job, like Tony yeah. Stark or whoever yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and actually in reality, like it's all, it's huge teams of people. And that's not just fusion, it's, it's anything. In fact, mm. it's like any big thing that you achieve, you've probably been supported by lots and lots of people. I mean, look at people like just the other week, there was the Brits, right? Everyone stands up and they thank everyone who's helped them get there. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and in, I think in, in some of these films, particularly when it comes to scientific achievements, they, they like the lone genius. They like yeah. this person who just comes out of nowhere and just solves this problem that everyone's been thinking about forever. And uh, I think it's just very, very unrealistic. There's yeah. so many people working together. It's like all about partnership yeah. and teamwork. And Although that's not to say uh, that there aren't like, you know, these massive breakthroughs that do happen. And I think sometimes maybe the public uh, like thinks that, that Fusion hasn't had any of these like, you know, uh, like massive breakthroughs and that's why we don't have it. But really there are these massive breakthroughs. They're just happening all the time, right? They're happening every week, every month, every year from like all these different scientists and all these different researchers are like, you know, pushing forward fusion science, like leaps and bounds, like all the time. Um, and so we have a bunch of Tony Starks. It's just, this problem is so hard. It's such a interesting, mm -hmm. challenging problem that we need like uh, a lot of Tony Starks, <laughs> you know, well-equipped, not just in, in caves, um, you know, doing really, really good work all the time. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. The, the people is a really important thing. Like you need uh, new smart people coming into the field, making these like incremental breakthroughs because the only, the only breakthrough or the milestone that, that the, like the media is going to care about is firstly getting more energy out than is put in. Mm. And secondly, like generating electricity. Having said that there are a lot, they do cover lots of little news stories along the way. Like yeah. fusion gets a lot of press. Mm. Um, 
but it's not like big fanfare press you know it's mm. it, it's all it's all the little things but no, you're completely right Sid. there are there are lots of little things going on all the time it's just like it's not enough because it's not the big like we've done it yeah exactly you don't recognize it in the same way <laughs> yeah. absolutely i think it's a theme that carries through a lot of these movies actually that they treat it as if there is one question and there's one problem that we need to fix for fusion to work and then that'll be it but that's not the case at all right there's so many different facets that we need to kind of approach whether it's the fuel kind of like your your actual reactor type getting onto the grid and stuff material size there are so many little bits to kind of take off and make breakthroughs in before we can get an actual working reactor so you know these one breakthrough probably will not be the the breakthrough that makes it it's just little ones throughout Mm, time that there's no ties it together uh, as as the saint has in it, uh, there's no there's no equation. They say yeah. <laughs> we've got the equation. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be uh, an equation that <laughs> sort Absolutely of. Not. Solves I think it the kind of golden right. bullet that they think is going to fix everything, unfortunately, I don't think quite exists. But yeah. We love you, it did, but you know we can all play our part, I guess, which is quite nice. All of the work that we're doing is kind of relevant and helpful in its in its real way, which is quite nice. Yeah. Well, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's um. It's not just like you say, just one one thing. And that, although it can sound more intimidating, it's also that's what makes it really exciting that there are so many facets. And even uh, for careers, like people coming into the field, it's mm. not just one thing again. It's not just like, oh, I want to contribute to fusion, so I'm going to be a plasma physicist. Uh, you could, there are so many different roles. There are so many different ways to contribute. Yeah. I mean, even on the science side, there are like electric engineers, mechanical engineers, cryogenics experts, neutronics experts. I mean, just to name a, a few, yeah. there are so many more. And then if you look at the wider ecosystem of everything that has to go in to to achieving fusion and then even beyond the science side and into more of the stuff that i work on these days which is more like i think about it as like the pathway to commercialization like what Mm. what else needs to be done there's so much and i think that yes it could be like intimidating but i just think it's really exciting yeah that there are so many different ways that people contribute to doing this thing which is going to be incredible Mm. no absolutely Mm. It's going to be um, better than the movies, we hope. Yeah, we <laughs> really hope so. <laughs> yeah. I think we've spent quite a lot of time today talking about these fusion examples in movies, right? It's kind of picking apart ever so slightly, talking about how realistic they are. You know, is it the one golden bullet? Is it going to be like an actual mini sun floating in midair? Probably not. Um, but I guess there is a big question to answer at the end in terms of, you know, does it really matter? You know, what is the implication of actually showing it, you know, in a realistic format kind of? bending the truth a little bit is it really going to have any kind of deeper implications on public perception for example i guess we kind of spoke a little bit now about um the kind of being like the one equation to crack type of thing is that kind of going to be misleading for the public do we think what kind of impact do we think these fusion representations are actually gonna have i mean i i think i think um a lot of people like like the idea of a hook so it's just something like really interesting that grabs someone's attention and for example, with Spider-Man 2, you know, that image that we all have um, that really like hooked us onto the topic. It was like, wow, this is interesting. Um, like, I think it's important for movies to have that um, or TV shows or whatever. Um, but then it's also quite nice if they are to portray it a tiny bit accurately. So people know, like if they were to be hooked and then to read about it a bit more to be like, you know, not this is like so different to the movie. Like to have like a natural progression from interest to like pursuit. I think yeah. that it's great that thing that fusion is featured in films because I think in general it's like we want fusion to be in the public consciousness. We we want people to like at least have heard of it and yeah. to know that it's a it's a potential energy source and like something that people are working on. I think that the the dangers or the things that make me a little bit uncomfortable is when they when they conflate or when they mess around with the safety aspects. Mm. So if they make it like Mm. feel really dangerous um, and it's not, um, then I think that that's bad because you don't want to have a public acceptance problem down the road for reasons that aren't actually true. True. So, so that worries me a little bit. Um, But in general, in general, I think it's probably not, not, not too much of an issue. Like I would hope, I mean, I don't think the films portray it, like that badly so far mm. um but i think that that's something to be to be conscious of but in general i think it's 
it's good that fusion is out there and we have to accept and understand that there's going to be artistic license they're making a film it's entertainment yeah. they're going to be doing something crazy and uh, and so we ha we kind of have to be okay with that and and hopefully hopefully help people to see you know what is fact and what is fiction and and hopefully like help the people who are writing these scripts to at least root it in reality like mm. root it in logic and what's actually actually possible and then if you can imagine something crazy beyond that like like what if we had this and what if we had that mm. if you can take it to somewhere exciting and interesting but it's rooted in reality then that's not so bad and yeah you have to accept that it's going to be it's going to be changed and convoluted because of this artistic license. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to remember is that it is obviously in movie for entertainment purposes, right? They're not doing it to watch a documentary and kind of learn more about it per se. It's just kind of not a plot point, something to kind of grab people's attention. It's not going to look bang on. Because um, sometimes the reality, I guess, can be a little bit boring because when we have our reactors, right, it's just essentially looking at it from the outside, a big metal box. Mm. It doesn't look that exciting and when you turn it on it doesn't look any different so if you have that in a movie right it's just it's not really going to grab people's attention it's not really going to get people enthusiastic about it but when you have it like in Iron Man when you have your open arc reactor and you can actually see the plasma kind of going around the plasma field coming it looks amazing it looks so cool yeah. it looks so exciting. it would be if it was all closed off you don't know what's going on inside there so I think it actually serves to even though it's not realistic obviously we wouldn't really want windows there probably um it still looks really cool and i think it kind of represents fusion in better light actually a little bit more accurately in terms of you can see what's going on and what it actually looks like because it can be a bit confusing as to what it would actually look like and it's mm. this billowing fuel that looks really cool actually but I think I think there's a lot of power in that for the you know movies having these artistic licenses and and being able to sort of essentially put anything on, on the screen. And that's why I love science fiction movies in general is they kind of, they, they have the ability to show science, not as we sort of see it every day, but as sort of, they can distill that inspiration that we have and, and, and put that in a more sort of pure, pretty way on screen kind of thing. Cause even, you know, you know, people doing theory on black holes kind of thing, they usually just look at pixels all day on, on computer screens and, and, and do some luminosity analysis and stuff like that. But, you know, movies like uh, Interstellar, for example, they allow you to see one kind of thing they, and, and, and kind of remind you of, of how cool something like this could be in real life. Unlike us, we usually just look at if anything, we look at simulation mm. or diagnostics, which are usually just like numbers going up and down. But for me, it's really nice to see, um, you know, like in Spider-Man and Iron Man, like this, this is what um, my idea of fusion looks like. And I think that's really powerful to, to be able to do that. Yeah, you're right. It's it's so important to have that um, that bigger picture, and like you say, it's really inspirational, and mm. and that can only be a good thing because, like, even if you're just thinking about new young people coming into the field, like they need to get excited about something. And I think in general, like maybe the reason that we like our jobs, certainly for me anyway, is that it's the bigger picture. I'm mm. really excited about the bigger picture, yeah. and. Mm -hmm. And so people making that bigger picture even prettier <laughs> and even more exciting yeah, yeah, exactly. like, <laughs> is not actually too bad a thing. As I said, mm. as long as they get the, as long as I don't scare people unnecessarily, then I'm okay yeah. with them, like yeah, yeah, yeah. taking it to crazy places. Mm. <laughs> and also speaking about crazy places, we don't really have time to go into space, but like fusion could even take people into space. And so it's, mm. it's really nice that like people love to dream. Mm. And so I think it's nice to have fusion as part of those dreams. Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a really nice place to end it, actually, kind of. Mm. Seems very inspirational, very positive. Like, <laughs> I think that was really nice. Yeah, absolutely. So overall, I think we're quite enthusiastic and happy about how it's being presented, right? It all looks very positive. We're very happy with it all. Yeah. It's been pretty good. I'd say some of the liberties of taking some of the science and early movies, maybe, maybe take them with a pinch of salt, but the most recent ones, actually. They're doing a fairly good job. It's mm. been pretty good. Um, so yeah, so with that, I've, I've just noticed the time, so I think we might have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Um, there are actually, obviously, a lot of other examples of fusion in movies that we just don't have time to cover today. Um, for example, it's shown in, you know, Passengers. It's shown in... Um, Oblivion, oh, The Expanse. There's a lot oh, The Expanse. Of <laughs> the one in The Expanse, it's amazing. Um, Star Wars as well, I think it appears very briefly as powering some 
is it the walkers the big walkers uh, maybe oh yeah the the 1880s. Things, ah, it, it, he's yeah. Also, there are several more examples that unfortunately we haven't got time to go through today but they are mm. definitely worth checking out if you have time so yeah so as you've listened to today if you have felt kind of inspired about fusion you do want to hear a little bit more about it um do have time for a shameless plug for two podcasts um we do have the glass of seawater podcast of which um this was a recording of today um as I said before, it's run by the Fusion CDT students and we talk about some of the kind of scientific side of Fusion, some of the ongoing research that's going on right now, some of the stuff that we know about. Um, and that's really good as kind of like a base introduction to Fusion, what it actually is, what kind of things it's going to entail. Um, and you can also tune into Fusion News as well, which is hosted by the um, Fusion Industry Association. Um, it's both on YouTube and as a podcast now, I believe as well. So you can tune into those. Um, and it's really good for helping to kind of keep up to date with some of these latest developments that are going on in Fusion because there's been some really cool things going on even in the past few months so you can keep up to date with them as they happen so please if you do want to kind of learn a bit more about Fusion those tools are accessible for you to check into at any point um so yeah so at this point I'd like to thank you all very much for coming on the episode today it's been really fun to kind of talk about these with you and plan it yeah. all I must thank you very much for your time and planning and appearing on the episode today so thank you all so much for coming um thank you yeah, it's been a lot you. of fun. Yeah, it's been lovely. It's been really cool. And then obviously, thank you all to the audience today for coming along to listen. I hope you found it somewhat informative and enjoyable and hopefully it's kind of showing you fusion in a slightly different light, whether it's in media or kind of feeling about it, hearing about it in other places. You know, so yeah, so thank you all very much and we'll end it there. Bye. Bye. Bye.